I want to address uh, an issue which actually goes back quite a ways in creationist history, and that is what are the created kinds and what are they what are they telling us about God? I, my first question, though, is why should we care? Um, a created kind is a term in the Bible, but uh, most people have lived their lives without ever realizing that there was such a thing in the in the Bible. So, what difference does it make? I I think there is great importance to this subject, much more importance than we have heretofore assigned to it. If we go back to the creation account and look at the origin of man itself, humanity. In the creation of man, God in, laid out his intention. God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Uh, the I don't have time to go into the ex exegesis of this particular passage, but there is good reason to believe that these two terms, our image and our likeness, refer to two different aspects of humanity, two different purposes, raison d'etre of humanity, why we are here. Why did God create us? First of all, we are created to be his image, which refers to our role as rulers of the creation. We're the only beings in the universe, uh, the only beings God created uh, for the purpose of ruling over those things that he made. He deserves to rule, but he actually created us to rule, specifically with that ability and uh, privilege uh, and assignment. Also, though, he created us after our likeness, after the likeness of God, that is referring to our sonship relationship with God. We have been created to have, we have the potential of becoming sons of God, of becoming the, uh, the progeny of God, or uh, another way to put it is we have been created to be in intimate relationship with God. We're the only beings, apparently, with that ability. Angels don't, they can worship God, they know God, they, but they apparently cannot be in intimate relationship with him, only humans. So this gives a dual, <clears throat> dual purpose for humanity, to rule and to know, to rule the creation and to know God. And, it, and he, that same passage continues, let man have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So there's our the institution of our ruler capacity in the creation. And then after God created man, he then commanded man, have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And uh, the psalmist in Psalm 8 comments on this, saying of God, you, God, have made man a little lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor. You've made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yes, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, and everything that passes through the paths of the sea. This is big. This is huge. This is Put the raison d'etre of humanity. This was part of what we've been created to do. And whether we want to or whether we have done a good job at it, it doesn't matter. We've been given this responsibility. We are rulers over those things that are made. <clears throat> this particular passage is uh, that refers to our rulership and sonship is reflected when in in the the way the Hebrew describes how God put man into the garden, why did once he created Adam? This is before the creation of Eve. Uh, he placed Adam into the garden for what purpose? The two Hebrew words used there can actually be translated two different ways. One way, which is the traditional way to translate it uh, in what we find, for example, in the King James, is to dress it and to keep it. That's actually referring to our rulership capacity in the garden, to take care of the garden, the physical creation known as the garden. But the two words juxtaposed there are juxtaposed only one other place in the Hebrew, 
And that is referring to priests acting in the temple. And in that particular context, the two words together are translated, your role as a priest is to worship and serve, to worship God and serve the uh, serve in the temple. And so applying those words back to the garden, a second purpose, why Adam was placed in the garden was to worship God and to serve God in the, in the garden. And that refers, of course, to the second purpose of humanity, which is to know God. And the very next thing that we see happening in this account then, after God placed him in the garden to dress and keep it and to worship God and serve God, he then puts Adam to sleep. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, he, he, before he does that, <laughs> he actually brings animals to Adam to see what Adam would call them. This is before he creates uh, Eve. This is, uh, this is the very first task that God, specific task, that God gave to Adam. And it's clear from the context that whatever this task is, it's part of this dressing and keeping and worshiping and serving the function that Adam was given in the garden. He begins that process, that dual function of humanity, with naming the animals. So Adam named uh, named the animals, and in that process, he began the uh, the role, the tasks, the dual roles that humanity has played ever since. He began to rule, and he began to know God. Because in the process of naming, if you're going to name it properly, if Adam is going to take this animal and give it a proper name, a name that's going to be with that animal from there on out, he has to understand the animal to some extent to give it the appropriate name. And in order to understand, or with the process of understanding, he now knows better how to rule over that animal. He knows better also what the creator is like who made the animal. So the process of naming is, is very definitely part of that role we have. We need to study the creation, to learn about the creation, to not just name the creation, which we'll, which we'll do automatically because of the way we're designed, but also so that we can better understand the creation, to rule better over it, and so that we can better know the creator who made it. Turning to this biblical kind concept, the question is, what do we rule over? In the creation account, we have a particular phrase, a particular Hebrew word, which is uh, mean, uh, M-I-N, uh, that's um, and transliterated, uh, which is translated kind in the in most English translations of the Bible. That word mean occurs 10 times in the creation account with reference to organisms. It refers to he, God created the trees, the plants, after their kind. He created the, the animals of the water and of the air after their kind. He, uh, he created the creatures of the land after their kind. Ten times this word with its, in a preposition form, is found in the creation account. Now, what does this mean mean? <laughs> Linguistically, the word could just mean various. So rather than translate it, God created uh, birds after their kind, a literal translation of the words as they, as they appear, it could be translated, God created various birds. Now, that, again, that's a possible linguistic, just straightforward linguistic interpretation of the phrase. but. When we look at the phrase elsewhere in scripture, because it appears again in the flood account, eight times it's mentioned in the flood account. It's uh, uh, Noah is told, you will bring the animals of the land uh, into the ark after their kind. And then 
when the ark is built, the animals of the land came into the ark after their kind. And at the end of the creation account, they left the ark after their kind. So it, it appears in this passage. Now here, it's not so clear that that word every sort will actually fit the context. This appears to suggest that we've got something, it's an, a, an actual biological grouping involved here. It's also used in the food law accounts in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Uh, things you're not supposed to eat, according to their kind. Things you are supposed to eat, according to their kind. And things that are unclean, according to their kind. All these things suggest that linguistically, it's probably not appropriate to translate kind as just simply every sort. Rather, it's referring to some specific biological grouping. So we conclude from this that we must be ruling over biblical kinds. We're ruling over the entire creation, but in regards to biology, we're ruling specifically over kind, whatever these mean are. When we use, again, looking at the use of this word in Hebrew, it's only used with organisms. Uh, no other reference, it's never like the word kind in English can be used, all kinds of things can be referred to as kinds. But in the Bible, that particular word mean is only referring to organisms. Secondly, we have uh, two or seven or sevens of each kind getting onto the ark, which means that a kind is bigger than just one. It's, it's apparently a group of organisms from which you can select two or seven to go onto the ark. Also, back to the creation account and the, and the naming, Adam named a whole bunch of organisms in a single day. It suggests that when the animals came to, to, to Adam, that Adam instinctively knew or understood or recognized those particular that, that particular organism. It was probably a sample, maybe one organism or maybe male and female or organism out of a kind that's out there brought to him. He, <clears throat> he recognizes it. It's, he's got an intuitive understanding of whatever this kind is. I believe God put within him this intuitive understanding of the kinds that God created. And we, the passage says that whatever Adam named the organism, that became its name. In other words, for generations to come, that remained its name. The organism must have, even if the organism, that particular organism died and is replaced by others, what, the, the members of that kind, of that group of organisms remain consist the same enough to be recognizable. So it's not just that they're intuitively recognizable to humans, but that that you <clears throat> that 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 uh, recognition persists through time. It's whatever this kind is, it remains unchanging even if individual members die and are replaced by other members. We're also told in that account that organisms were supposed to reproduce and refill the earth or fill the earth. That suggests that the organisms are created with the capacity to reproduce and there's reproduction within the kinds to, to, to allow the kinds to continue. So we deduce from this that a kind of mean is a recognizable group of organisms that must be similar enough to be recognizable that persists through time by members of the kind interbreeding to produce similar offspring. So we have an initial definition, if you wish, of a biblical kind. We can add to that the fact that we have kinds of plants created on day three, kinds of animals created on days five and another set on day six, that apparently the kinds have separate origins from each other. Each kind is separately created by God without a common ancestor between and among the kinds. 
<clears throat> and again, we have that recognizability, meaning not just that they're similar to each other, so you recognize members of it, but they're distinct from other kinds. So we're both similar within the kind and dissimilar between kinds. And, and given when we put together these concepts that we have a kind that's recognizable through time and distinct from other kinds, it must mean that kinds remain distinct from other kinds through time. They always are distinct. So now we have a a working definition of a kind. It's a recognizable group of similar organisms that remains distinct through time, persisting by members of interbreed members interbreeding to produce similar offspring. So there we have a definition of the biblical kind of the mean uh, from scripture. Now, if we look at history a little bit, we recognize that uh, very early on, the Vulgate is a Latin translation of the Bible uh, produced by Jerome in the fifth century, I think it was. It was adopted very early on by the Catholic Church, which became, of course, uh, sort of equated with the uh, Roman Empire, the, the Latin Empire. And so it was the obvious choice for a Bible translation. And that became the standard for the church for centuries. In fact, in some, in many places, it's still the official translation of the, uh, of the Catholic Church. In the Vulgate, in Latin, if you're reading the Genesis account and you come to the Hebrew word mean, you will encounter the Latin word species. So in the Vulgate, Jerome translated the word mean as species. So if you were reading the Bible in Latin uh, or heard the Bible spoken to you in Latin, if you couldn't read it, for centuries, you would, e you would equate the whatever the biblical kind is with species. So in, at any given time during that period of time, you would have recognized organisms in the world around you as species, recognizable groups of similar organisms that interbreed to produce similar offspring. They would have been called species. And then you got the Bible that says that God created species. What is, it's only natural that people would believe that the species they see about them, the Latin word species that we see about, about everyone, and the species spoken of in the creation account are the same thing. And if that's true, then the species in the creation account don't change through time. And so the species that we see today, or that you saw in your day, would have been the same as they were in the creation. That organisms, every species you see about you was created in the original creation, just as it is now, and it's not changed through time. This is a a concept of the history of biology I call a Linnaean lawn, because in the days of Linnaeus in the early uh, 18th century, this probably would have been the most common belief about organisms through time back into the back into history, that God created the species we see as they are in the original creation, and they haven't changed. Like a leaf is every blade of grass in a lawn is separately planted from a separate seed and the blade of grass goes straight up without changing all the way to the present from the creation all the way up to the present if you have time in the in the vertical and so all the different species represented by all the different uh, blades of grass have been unchanged since the creation and there hasn't been a whole lot of time uh, since the creation, so we got a, we got short grass. Grass is it's a it's a short grass uh, type view of the history of biology. Then along comes Carl Linnaeus. Now he 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 lives through most of at least three quarters of the 18th century. Uh, he started out believing that species were the biblical kind. He started out believing in species fixity that species don't change with time from the creation. 
but and he he focused mainly on plants. He began observing plants that began to convince him that there were species out there that were intermediate between other species that looked like you they were formed by hybridization between two other species. As he went along in his life, these became more and more common till he was convinced that there really were hybrids between species in the real world. Now, that really messes with your brain if, in fact, you believe that species haven't changed since the creation and don't and 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 can't uh, can't become like other species. And so he, uh, Linnaeus began to consider the possibility that the biblical mean, uh, not the not the Latin word species, but the biblical kind was probably a bigger group than a species. And as he went along in his life and found more and more of these hybrids, he began thinking that the biblical kind was even bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, he died, he was beginning to wonder if the biblical kind wasn't at about the level of the family. Now, since the time of Linnaeus, these suspicions of Linnaeus have really been confirmed over and over again. We really do have interspecific hybrids. We've created interspecific hybrids artificially. We've observed interspecific hybrids in, in the real world. In fact, a very large percentage of a given family of organisms uh, can in fact produce viable uh, hybrids. And we even have species in the living world that are similar to each other, next to each other, and over where they overlap there are hybrids in the zone of overlap, creating hybrid zones. And we've discovered in the fossil record also, there are examples of two species uh, uh, at different stratigraphic levels. And then in between them, in a level in between them, is an, a, a species that looks intermediate between those two, what I call a stratomorphic intermediate. It's stratigraphically intermediate and it's morphologically intermediate between the uh, apparent ancestor and descendant. All these things seem to confirm that species change uh, and that species can interbreed with other species and thus suggest that the created kind, the mean, is bigger than a species. For example, in the horse family, we have arguably, people disagree, but approximately nine species of horse, three species of zebra, these three species of uh, more or less, three species of regular horse, three species of ass. Uh, and we have made hybrids between most of those combinations. We have zorses between zebras and the horses. We have zebrasses and we have uh, zonkeys and we have uh, and on it goes. <clears throat> so it, it's, it appears as if most of the, it, all of the species in the horse family are in fact uh, capable of interbreeding with all the other uh, species of horses. So we are sort of back to our, if we have to cast off the idea that species equal kinds, uh, we have to ask what are the biblical kinds? By the mid 20th century, <clears throat> Hybrids had convinced many people, many creationists, that mean was not only higher than a species, but actually higher than a genus. And it was getting to be kind of popular to, at least in certain circles, to suggest that the mean was approximately the level of the uh, taxonomic family, just as Linnaeus had, <clears throat> had uh, uh, suspected a couple centuries earlier. It uh, brings us to 1941. There was a creationist by the name of Frank Marsh who uh, was at that point, by the time he wrote his biology textbook of, in 1941, he was pretty much convinced that the created kind was at the level, in many cases, of the family. It might have been a little lower. I mean, uh, 
genus level for some groups, maybe a little higher in other groups, but somewhere around there. And so he, he, he wanted to classify organisms this way, but the question was what do you call these groups? We, if we call them kind, the English word kind has all sorts of different meanings. That can be confusing. Uh, it really needed a distinctive word that, um, uh, that, that would separate it from all other possible meanings. And you could use the, the Hebrew word mean, but in English, mean doesn't sound, <laughs> doesn't sound quite right. It's got another meaning in English. So Frank Marsh suggested, he had several suggestions, but one of them was to take two Hebrew words, bara, which is the verb to create, and mean, and put them together to create the word baraman, uh, which would literally be translated uh, created kind. This particular term uh, was picked up by a few people and liked, uh, and uh, it's now been adopted as the technical term for created kind. In 1990, this would be 30 years ago now, I created a classification system based upon the created kind as a Brahman and called the classification methodology Brahmanology. Now, I concur that the creation of that word, barominology, I, I, I admit I did it. It's a horrible evil. It's a sin, sin, I know. You don't, you aren't supposed to make words from two different languages. So baraman derived from the Hebrew, uh, logos from the, uh, <clears throat> from the, uh, the, the Greek. Uh, they're not supposed to put those together. Sorry. Uh, my apologies to all those people I have just uh, insulted, but I create. I thought the the ology, the the study of, or the uh, the the examination of, or the knowledge of created kinds was a great term for this classification system. So, in any case, there uh, people bought the uh, the term so baromenology exists it's the identification and study of created kinds of study of baromans in baromenology we adopt this basic idea of the biblical kind uh, for the baroman the baroman is a recognizable group of similar organisms that remains distinct persisting by members of interbreeding to produce similar offspring. The process of baromenology searches for groups of organisms that are very similar to one another. With the, the organisms within the group are very, very similar, high similarity, separated from other groups with high similarity by gaps, uh, by what we call deep discontinuity, gaps of form, in other words, they look different. Uh, there's nothing in the zone in between these two uh, baramans. And uh, it's not possible to cross that boundary. You can't do it by hybridization. You can't do it by organisms changing across the boundary. Apparently, that is an unbridgeable gap. When we have similar organisms surrounded a group of similar organisms surrounded by an unbridgeable gap all the way around it, we call that a holobaraman, or a, uh, it's, a, it's, it's our best guess, our theory on what the baraman actually is for those organisms. How do we determine what's a baraman and what isn't? The very first method used goes all the way back to Linnaeus, and that is the concept of hybridization. The idea here is that if two organisms can in fact hybridize, they can cross with one another and produce an offspring uh, that, that is viable, that, that is a happy little feller, then that suggests that the two organisms that did that must be very similar. I mean, we even know examples uh, among humans where two people get married and they're not compatible for having children. It doesn't take much to kick something off of the ability to interbreed and produce viable offspring. 
So one would think, at least this is our intuitive sense, that if two organisms, even if they're from different species, could produce an offspring, then it must mean they're really, really very similar. And that suggests they're probably similar enough to be placed or to be considered part of the same Brahman. And so baromenology, the process of bioclassification looking for created kinds, uses hybridization uh, as one of its criteria to unite organisms into uh, created kinds. But it isn't the only method. We also use some, uh, some statistical methods. We use something called baromenic distance correlation. Don't have time to go into it, but basically it's measuring the uh, how similar, it's quantitatively measuring how similar organisms are and uh, measuring how similar they are within groups and then measuring how dissimilar they are to other groups. And when we have sufficient, what we whatever we deem to be sufficient dissimilarity with other groups and sufficient similarity within, we say, aha, we have identified the whole of Brahman or the, our postulate about what the created kind is. We also use uh, analysis of pattern. We plot the, uh, the, the organisms. We characterize the organisms by a bunch of characters. We plot these things in multi-dimensional space, and we then project it into two or three dimensions that we can actually visualize and look at it. And if the one set of organisms looks like it's in, uh, you know, sufficiently similar uh, to uh, the, that it might be a created kind and another group looks like it's sufficiently similar to that it might be created kind and that there looks like there's a zone of discontinuity between that gap in between, then we might conclude by this, uh, an OPA is a visual phenomenon. We look at the projection of points and we say, ah, I think there's good reason to believe we've got sufficient similarity and sufficient dissimilarity to say we've got created kinds. Uh, those aren't the only methods we have. We use, and whenever we can, we use information from the Bible. There's not a lot from the Bible, but for example, we know from the Bible that humans are separately created from everything else. So we can't, we, we have that as a criterion, a standard, whatever methods we've developed, if they're not able to distinguish humans and chimps or whatever, then we haven't, we haven't made it there yet. <laughs> so we, we use biblical data when we can. As I said, we've, we use hybridization, analysis of pattern, baromenic distance, uh, multidimensional scaling. We use a fossil Fossils, uh, paleontologists, I had to throw in some fossil information here. Uh, and we use anything we can that might give us of sufficient similarity or sufficient difference to identify the created kinds. So what have we learned? It's now been 30 years since it created uh, baromenology. And we got a long ways to go. We haven't done very much. We're not, there are not very many of us. Uh, and there are an awful lot of critters, <laughs> uh, uh, organisms in the world. We haven't applied baromenology to very many of them. Uh, but, mm, you know, scores, maybe as many as 100. I don't know. It's, it's uh, somewhere around that many. And we're talking about 1.8 million species. So we got a long ways to go. But what we have some... Uh, uh, clues. Uh, well, we see some patterns in what we have done. And so I want to go through a few of those things and give you uh, sort of an update on what baromenology has taught us in 30 years. First of all, uh, as was suspected by Linnaeus and was suspected by mid 20th century creationists, the created kinds we've been able to identify, the Brahmins we've been able, been able to identify, are often very close to a taxonomic family in, in size. Uh, some of them might be a little smaller, some of them might be a little bigger, uh, but that is close to where it is, just to give you kind of a broad uh, uh, feel for what a created kind would be. Um, in mammals, it looks like there's within 
domesticated mammals have been worked on probably more than any other group of, of organisms in baromenology. In mammals, it looks like the average created kind has scores of species. If you consider both fossils and living, uh, fossil species and living species, there is maybe about 100, 120, somewhere in there is an average number of species per created kind. In contrast, if we look at insect and plant baromans, we haven't done a lot in these areas, but what, li what little we've done suggests <laughs> the baromans are much bigger. There are thousands of species, and maybe even in some cases, tens of thousands of species in some of these baromans. And again, this then gives us a feel for how big baromans are. That means there are probably thousands of the, the number of Brahmins in the world is probably in the order of thousands, not millions. There's millions of species, but probably only thousands, tens of thousands of Brahmins. An interesting consequence of just this information is that it solves some Bible difficulties, at least some difficulties some people have with the Bible. For example, how in the world did you fit all of the land animal species onto the ark? Uh, if, in fact, Noah is only taking a sample two or seven from each created kind, then he's not taking millions or even thousands of, uh, of, of organisms on the, or uh, tens of thousands of organisms onto the ark. He's probably only at most uh, taking thousands of individuals onto the ark, probably less than 10,000. So it's pretty easy to fit all of the land animal kinds onto Noah's Ark. And of course, not everything goes onto the Ark. Things that are swimming are supposed to fend for themselves, so you don't have to count them. Uh, and if we go back to the creation account where Adam names the organisms, uh, it looks like from the account, he names all the birds and the animals of the garden in a single day. That can still be a lot of organisms if, in fact, he's naming every species. But if he's naming every kind, uh, and, and a sample from each kind, it's probably well less than 300 Brahmins that he has to name in a single day, and it's possible for him to do that in a day. If we take this concept that the Brahmins are actually uh, on the order of hundreds to thousands of species each, and we combine that with the observation that two to seven of each land animal got onto the ark, we realize that if we have land animal baramans that have a hundred species in them, it must be that we went somehow went from just two or seven uh, of that baraman to a hundred species in the present. This suggests that within created kinds, species must have come into existence after the flood that weren't there on the ark. And even if it's at the level of the family, genera must have come into being. Uh, and maybe tribes and sub-tribes all came into being after the flood. And if you saw this, it might look like, you know, a single pair of organisms generated species that generated other species that generated other species, uh, it, it would kind of look like a tree diagram of organisms that evolved into different species within the created kind, within each created kind. This is called intra-baromenic diversification. It's within the, bar the baromen, and it's diversifying within the uh, created kind. If that's true, then species are not part of a Linnaean law. They they haven't they're not the same today as they were in the creation. They they haven't remained unchanged through time. Nor are we speaking about an evolutionary tree where every species in the present is in fact derived from a single common ancestor, such as evolutionary theory argues. What is true is something sort of in between, that from the flood account to the present, organisms within each created kind have diversified in a little tree within that uh, created kind. So it's rather than a Linnaean lawn or an evolutionary tree, 
life is more like a creationist orchard. Each individual kind is represented by a separate tree planted by God, created by God in, in the beginning. And that tree can branch, producing new species in general within the created kind, each created kind, so that we have a whole bunch of uh, trees in the creationist orchard, separately created, uh, do not overlap with each other, do not intermingle with each other, s remain constant, remain that same tree through time, even though you have changes within that group. What's interesting about this concept, just sitting back and looking at it for a moment, is if this is true, then the history since the flood, if, you, if you're looking within a Brahman, looks like evolution. And in fact, the evidences that evolutionists have put forward for macroevolution, for the origin of all organisms from a single common ancestor, most of that is actually evidence of the diversification within created kinds. So much of the evidence that evolution uh, lays out for evolutionary theory actually is, uh, is nothing more than intrabaraminic diversification. And we can accept these evolutionary arguments as evidence of uh, uh, diversification in a creationist model. Uh, an interesting question. What about the time between the flood and the creation? We, we can infer from the present perhaps what the created kind was that got off of the ark in the case of, of land animals. But what about before that? What does the, the history of life look like before that? Well, one thing we do know is that when we look at the flood sediments, the animals that are preserved in the flood, we see that we can identify apparent Brahmins and that Brahmins had many species in them like Brahmins do in the present. And so that suggests that when organisms were sampled to go onto the ark, for example, it's only one species, perhaps, maybe you could get a couple in there, uh, in your seven. Uh, it's, it's only perhaps one species that's represented on the ark out of dozens, scores, hundreds of species in that created kind that existed at the time of the flood. Uh, so we, the proper view of things is that we have the orchard springing out of one organism from a whole set of organisms that existed at the moment that the flood began. What about before that? Did, were those organisms exactly the species that existed at the time of the flood? Were they the same ones created? Or did organisms uh, within created kinds diversify like they did after the flood? We don't know. <laughs> What's the story between the creation and the flood? Uh, at this point, we don't know, and I don't have the faintest clue how to figure it out. <laughs> so that's an unknown. Uh, another observation. We see in the biblical account references to lions, camels, and wheat by the patriarchs. We see it, in fact, as early as in the book of Job. Well, it turns out these organisms, lions within the cat family, camels, the, uh, the desert camel, within the camel family, wheat within the, uh, within, within the Poaceae family, are what we call derived species. These are not species found in the fossil record close to the flood, in the diversification within the created kinds, these are organisms that are up at the top. They weren't there at the beginning. In other words, there wasn't a lion on the ark. There was a cat on the ark, representing the cat family, the cat created kind. Uh, and lions came about after the flood, according to fossil record, a long time after the flood. Many, many species came into being before lions came into being. Same with camels. The desert camel wasn't on the ark. There was a camelid, a camel, uh, a member of the camel uh, created kind on the ark, but it wasn't a camel. It was probably more like a llama uh, or a, 
uh, guanaco or something. And camels come about very late in the record. Wheat also among the plants. Not that it, there wasn't wheat per se, probably on the ark, wheat is a derivative long afterwards. These are like the tips of the branches of these trees. But the patriarchs where, they're, where these things are mentioned are living as early as two centuries or three centuries after the flood, which means that all the camels you know, had to come into existence before the modern camel came into existence. That means all camels, fossil and living, must have come into being before even Babel. Likewise, all the horses, all the uh, all the cats, the, the lions, tigers, and all of that sort of thing, uh, the uh, various types of poaceae, tens of thousands of species of, of uh, the poaceae, were already in existence by Babel. In other words, these trees that you're seeing there, they, they've already fully diversified within a couple centuries of the flood. That means the true picture here is that the tree is squashed down to a very short thing, only 200 years long, 200 to 300 years long. And once the diversification had occurred, then species remain unchanged all the way to the present. So we got rapid diversification within created kinds that ceased at some point, approximately the time of Babel, and things have remained pretty much the same ever since then. Now, that means that our diversification process is really, really fast. <laughs> it's uh, some people mockingly call it hyper evolution or evolution on steroids. Uh, it isn't either one of those because it's just too fast for evolution. It's too fast for any process we know about. It suggests that there is, and I'm going to call it a change program, that there is a, a something analogous to a computer program inside organisms that in fact creates the change. Uh, and and it's it was put there by God, I believe, in the creation event, way back at the creation. He anticipated these needs. He anticipated what was going to be needed, and he put a change program into organisms. Now, I'm not going to say what that is because I don't know what it is. It could be God himself that's putting the information into organisms, but I think there's evidence to indicate he somehow put it into organisms and that it's there. Is it in the DNA? I don't know. I doubt it, but maybe. Uh, we don't know. We don't know what the program is, and we don't know where it is. It's one of the interesting questions of of uh, creation biology. But it appears there's some sort of program in all organisms that permits organisms under these circumstances, for example, to diversify. Another observation. From the fossil record, we do not see the pattern that's shown here on the screen. What you see on the screen is a gradual change through time of organisms, normal branching trees, uh, something more analogous to trees we're familiar with in the present. What we see in the fossil record is something quite different. Immediately after the flood and for those couple centuries, species just appear in the fossil record. They don't gradually change from another species. Uh, the observation that was made popular by Stephen Jay Gould is that species appear abruptly, and then once they appear, they don't change. It's abrupt uh, stasis and abrupt appearance is what he argued for from the fossil record. So rather than the, the actual diversification process looking like this diagram, it's more like this. And the changes, when you put a creationist time scale on this, the changes are apparently happening in single generations. So one organism, one species or one genus is producing another species or genus or subtribe in a single generation. Poof, it's creating a new organism. In other words, one organism actually gives birth to a different taxon, to a different species, a different genus. Uh, this appears to be part of the design of the change program. It makes changes in single generations. What we also learn is that this diversification 
brings traits to organisms or organisms uh, uh, traits appear in organisms at just the right time and place. For example, in a study of the genus Flavaria, done by Todd Wood, published in, 19, in 2002, he noted that the different species of Flavaria uh, plots in morphospace in such a way that it looks like the species evolved from at least one end of that arch to the other uh, and in a nice sequence. If you look at the species and determine what kind of photosynthesis the species are doing, that's represented by the green through the blue, you find that the green ones are actually using uh, C3 photosynthesis. There's a difference in the way photosynthesis is done. Uh, C3 photosynthesis does all the all the all the steps in a single cell. C4 photosynthesis separates it into separate cells. It's a it's a C4 is a very complicated, even more complicated than photosynthesis is per se. It's a it's another way to do photosynthesis that is uh, very useful under very hot, warm, dry conditions. And if you plot the, the whether you're C3 or C4 or actually intermediates between the two. It's interesting, they show up in the diagram in such a way that it looks like you could go from C3 all the way up to C4 or start with C4 and go all the way to C3. If you geographically plot them, the C4 uh, photosynthesis plants are sitting in desert regions or near desert regions, and the C3 plants are sitting in the wet tropics. And, and so it appears that Flavaria genus, as it was diversifying and as it was moving into uh, certain environments, actually changed according to the needs of the environment. This suggests that something in the change program is actually perhaps able to detect the environment and make changes accordingly. <laughs> and, and, and C4 photosynthesis, wild as it is, as complicated as it is, actually appears in 16 plant families at about the same time in North America alone. 16 different families, which means 16 different created kinds. Uh, and, and they're all about the same time. And at that same moment, we have grassland evidence. Uh, the, uh, uh, the pollen indicates that grasslands are spreading across North America. In other words, North America is drying after the flood and, and, uh, and, and it's, it's getting hot and dry in the mid-continent area. You're producing deserts, not in the mid-continent, uh, sorry, in the Southwest. You're producing desert conditions for the first time. And in response, 16 different families of organisms actually uh, uh, develop C4 photosynthesis, I think, because it was built into their uh, into that change program from the creation. If we look at horses, a study done by uh, Todd, and myself, and David Cavanaugh, published in 2003, the fossil record of horses, if you look at fossil horses, uh, we have what appears to be a nice arch, again, of uh, representatives. And here, if you look at the age of the horses, uh, the fossil, these are fossils. So the horses that are in the lowest sediments are represented in the dark blue. The, the, organ, the uh, horses that are in the highest sediments are rec represented in the light blue. The yellow that you can barely see there are the modern horses. All the modern horses are in that yellow dot. And, uh, and then the green are intermediate in position. It looks like from the, and the oldest horses are right after the flood, it looks like horses changed through time following the flood. And in fact, this represents, if you actually look at the critters, as an increase in size, which corresponds to the cooling in North America. All these forms, by the way, are found in North America. North American continent is cooling down after the, after the flood. The flood has warmed up the ocean waters of the world and heated up the whole world as a consequence. And as the ocean waters cool, the continents cool. And it turns out that bigger body size is more advantageous for mammals 
under cooling conditions. So actually these organisms are, are adjusting to those different condu con conditions. Also, if you look at the teeth of the horses, hypsodonty is increasing. Hypsodonty is a, a way of doing teeth, a way of designing teeth that allows them to eat grass. Grass has nasty little particles of silica in there that tear down and destroy normal teeth. You have to have special teeth. You basically have to have hypsodont teeth to graze on grass. And horses develop hypsodonty as we go up here. Horses also go from five toes to one toe in the course of this sequence. They change their gait uh, uh, to trotting and other things characteristic of horses. All in all, what we're doing is changing from horses that are grazing on on leaves of uh, on on leaves of plants in the forest to horses that are browsing on grass in grasslands. So this this happens to correspond to the drying of North America. We have both the cooling and the drying of North America, and the organisms seem to be the horses in this case seem to be responding. And of course. It isn't just in horses. Hypsodonty appears in a dozen mammal families in North America all at the same time, at the same time that we have evidence of the drying of North America, where hypsodonty would be most useful, where the, in the drying conditions, the grasslands increase. So now you need to eat grass. Well, you've got to have hypsodont teeth. And I believe the change program God put in all these organisms allows them to adjust to that. And the size increase also occurs in most mammal groups all around the world at the same time. Again, the uh, overall cooling of the earth after the flood. And so there seems to be a fact, the claim that the change program responds to the environment. So we went from an arc horse, probably something similar to Hyracotherium pictured here, to the modern horse. And in the process, we went from five toes to, to one toe. The modern horses have one toe, and on either side of that one toe, there's a little there's there's vestiges or pieces of two other toes. These are vestigial toes that are uh, that every horse has. Evidence of the fact that it is actually descendant from a horse with five toes. Also, every once in a while, those two bones will in fact grow down the length of the toe to produce two additional toes. And occasionally you get a three-toed horse. This is called an atavism, uh, something uh, recurring from the past. This, the change program that still exists in horses still has the ability to make toes, make five toes. And every once in a while, it gets turned on and it makes those five toes. We can explain this in the creation model. Uh, it turns out to be very difficult to explain in an evolutionary model because if something isn't used for the time scale they would have is 50 million years, then you're going to lose it. But we still have it. So the fact that these things still exist suggests the change that's occurred, that's real, only occurred a very short time ago. This change program we're learning is responsible for all sorts of cool things. And I see my time is almost completely gone. So I'm going to have to just quickly, <laughs> quickly do this. Uh, we Vestigial organs and atavisms, as I've already referred, uh, we can explain the origin of breeds, uh, useful organisms as hidden information that is in the change program and made to uh, to appear when it is when it's needed. Can explain microevolutionary uh, evidences that are used to uh, evidence evolution. It's uh, it's quite exciting actually how much it can explain. Overall, if we look at this uh, from a slightly different uh, perspective, we see created organisms are created with a change program that allows them at, after the flood to fill in the gaps within created kinds to diversify. Why? Why did God do that? Why did God create organisms with the ability to diversify? Because he illustrates his nature in the way things are. If, if the flood decimated organisms, you're, you, you don't have millions of species. You probably only have thousands of species at the end of the flood. But he doesn't want humans to miss what he's put into the creation. So he has to have each created kind <clears throat> re-diversify within one human lifetime 
humans are living for hundreds of years, so you, you've got a little bit of time. <clears throat> Within one human lifetime, you've got to restore the illustrations that you lost in the flood. <clears throat> That's the reason for this change program. Also, he anticipates in the creation that uh, how the or how the earth's going to change after the flood. So he probably doesn't need desert organisms in the original creation, but he does after the flood. So he puts that into the change program. He puts the ability of organisms to adapt to environments into the organisms. So when those adaptations are needed, they come into being. In the modern epoch, we see uh, organisms that were created for the purpose of remediation, medicine, the work that we have experienced in the present. Again, created by God in the original creation, in the change program, for us when we need it. Then if we think back at the fall, it's probable that he put into this change program the, the things that organisms would need after the fall. So even though they did, there were no carnivores in the original creation, he probably created organisms with the information to become a carnivore. At the curse, it is then activated, the change program is activated, and these things come into being. All this means that God is providing. This is a stunning realization here. He, in the creation, he anticipates all these things and he puts it all into organisms. He has this incredibly beautiful process uh, to provide for the needs of organisms and for man. So what we're beginning to learn from bear monology uh, is, I think, the whole point. What we have been supposed to be doing this for, organisms were created by an awesome God who is worthy of our praise. That's what bear monology is just beginning to give us, <laughs> give us insight into, and that's the purpose of barominology. That's why it's important. That's why it's important. Eh, not all of you are going to do it professionally, but at least to keep up with it and to worship the God who made those things that exist. Thank you.